You may be seated. We serve an awesome, mighty God. And he knows where we are. He knows everywhere we go, everything we do. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're planning. We hope that we're not planning something that isn't in his will. Amen? Sometimes we think we've lost some things. Sometimes we think things are just going the way we expected them to go, the way we planned them, sort of. I wouldn't want to say that we planned God out of things, <clears throat> but maybe a little sometimes. And so, years ago when I was going uh, to uh, the Congo or someplace, it doesn't matter, and all my luggage was lost. I had nothing except the clothes on my back and my Bible in my purse. And I was complaining to God after we got there a little bit. I know I'm probably the only one that's ever done that, but I just was complaining a little bit because if God is in control of everything and he sent me there, why would he allow my luggage to get stolen? It's a question, just a question. And so I just a little bit was walking on the shores of Lake Tanganyika and I was complaining a little bit about that. God, why did you do that? And all of a sudden I heard my spirit, I heard the Lord say, I know, isn't that sad? <laughs> yes, it really is. I don't have any clothes to wear. This is what I am right here with my shoes. And he said, I know, now all you have is me. Oh, <clears throat> tears went away, crying stopped. Because God has a way of convicting you. Of, and I, and please tell me, I'm not the only one who's ever complained to God. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, no. So we serve Almighty God. Yeah. And over this weekend, yesterday and today, we have a, a man who's anointed by the Holy Spirit yeah. to teach the Word of God, to open it up to us, to help each one of us understand better what God is saying to us in His Word. Sometimes we just, we look at the word and we think it's, we can't put it into today's thoughts and how we think about that word today and I think this word means that and I get so tired of people saying that all the time. I think it means this, I think it means that. And then they get into arguments over what it means and they're not even close to what it means. It takes some study and some thought and some prayer. So this morning, before I get too carried away here, we are live streaming this morning. So welcome to all of you who are out there. We're so glad that you've tuned in to us this morning. It's going to be a great day. Make sure you have your Bible handy, and make sure that you have a notepad and pen handy so you can make notes on the scriptures. So, uh, Chuck, would you come up? So let's give him a hand. Let's welcome him. <laughs> Chuck is an old friend. Well, not that old. He's got a little ways to go. <laughs> He is getting older though, but uh, I'm not, so <laughs> we've been frozen friends. Frozen in time. Frozen in time, yeah, that's right. Yes, frozen in time. So, um, perpetually old. No, that's not a good idea. Perpetually young. So, we're happy, to, we're always excited to bring Chuck here because he brings, people learn, everybody learns something when Chuck comes. You may think that you know the Bible really well, and that's great and that's wonderful, but you can always learn more. Amen. Because there's so much here, we'll never <clears throat> plumb the depths of everything that's in that book. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing, never. So we look forward to Chuck when he comes. Chuck is a black and white person. It's, this is the way it is. If you don't like it, that's too bad. No, that's not exactly the way it is, but, but he speaks the truth of what the Word says. And it's up to us to open our hearts to hear what, what the Lord is saying to each one of us. Yes. And what he's saying to my friend out there may be different than what he's saying to me or to you or to someone else. You know, God speaks your language. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's important. He knows exactly what you can understand or what I can understand. And so we praise God for that. Chuck and I have been friends for about 35 years. Uh, then we got to know one another. No. Can I pray for you now before I get into any more trouble? <laughs> let's hold out your hands to Chuck and let's pray. Father, I thank you. 
that you brought Chuck to us again. Yes, yes. I thank you for what you put in his heart and what you are preparing for us in his heart. So Lord, I pray that he is bold. I pray that he is he's filled with grace because you are within him. And that Father, he speaks your truth. Not his truth, not our truth, but your truth, Father. Yes. So Lord, open our hearts that we might hear your truth, that we might apply it into our own lives, that we might, when we make our notes, have better understanding when we leave here of something that you want us to understand. So we give this time to you, God, and pray that you are glorified in this place on this day. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Am I, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh -huh. Great. Well, we had a great time last night. For those that weren't here, uh, I started talking about prophets. And there's a growing burden in my heart regarding prophetic ministry. I've been around it, involved with it for many, many years now. And 2020 was a really bad year for the prophets in a lot of ways. And we are involved in this nation with a shaking in which God is shaking both the church and the nation. How many would agree that 2020 has been a year like no other? Amen. I agree with that. And so right around the corner is 2021. What does the Lord have in store? Jesus warns about false prophets when asked about end times. But you don't have counterfeit unless there's also real. True. And, true. and so that's what I uh, started to do last night as we talked about the kind of the character traits of a real prophet. And I want to pick up an episode in the life of Paul this morning and demonstrate the role of prophecy in his life, how he uh, responded to it, and how the Lord came to him, as he will to us, in the greatest uh, trials of our life, there's pretty much only one thing God wants to do. He wants to give you a fresh word. He wants to speak to you. Why? Well, all things happen by his word, and the good shepherd speaks wonderful things to the sheep. And so, uh, let me pray, and Lord, help us. I'm assuming with me, uh, help me, Marcy, here now, with me being online, I'm probably not going to be able to move as much around as I would normally. I'll follow you. Oh, yes, she'll please. follow. Now, there's a faithful sheep, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, if a, an Italian can't move around and use his arm, that's called a speech impediment. <laughs> so, praise God. Um, Father, we love you, we need you. Lord, help us in these days. Draw us close. Open up our ears and eyes. And give us grace to respond. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you've heard the phrase, uh, they missed the forest for the trees. 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 Uh, that's a very simple phrase, but it's very truthful. And it really relates to our walk with God. Many believers miss the big picture as they're being consumed, sometimes with just a little corner of the portrait. And if you, I don't know about you, but once in a while you go to Zoom and you back off from planet Earth. I mean, you get real close to Walker and you can see Leech Lake and everything so there and big and vibrant. And then all of a sudden you back off and Walker's kind of small and Leech Lake's kind of small. It's just part of a bigger picture. So we're going to talk about the forest today as we wrestle with the trees. Uh, there's a pretty uh, popular poem, or I don't know, popular, maybe famous, 
Footprints in the sand, have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And footprints in the sand is a believer and Jesus kind of walking together through life. Two sets of footprints. All of a sudden, there's only one set of footprints. And there's a timeline, I evidently, in the believer, Lord, that, that's the time in my life when I, I didn't really think you cared. Where were you? I certainly wasn't hearing very good. And, oh child, that's when I was carrying you. And years ago, I thought I had a hold of the rock. But then a senior leader came into the church and told us, the rock has a hold of you. So we want to look at Paul's remarkable journey in his life from a place called Corinth to Rome. And in that, and I'm going to only give you highlights because it's, it's really an epic story, but there are like diamonds, there's like gems that hopefully you can embrace for your life and, and learn from them. Let me give you a bit of backdrop. From about 53 to 56, Paul spent three years in Ephesus. It was a spectacular ministry. Unusual miracles took place. Extraordinary miracles is the word. Uh, the power of God explodes. The Bible says all Asia heard the word of God. Paul is just apostolically on a roll. Churches were birthed out of Ephesus. He didn't even go to them. Places like Colossae, Laodicea, and others. Towards the end of that three-year period, there was a kickback from hell. The warfare was beyond anything he had experienced. See, Ephesus was the witchcraft center of the world. And he was full onslaught establishing the kingdom in that city. And then there was a kickback. While he's also there in Ephesus, he gets a report about his precious church in Corinth and there's all kinds of issues going on there. So he writes what we know as 1 Corinthians. And, and he was, almost the moment he sent the letter, almost got burdened that it was too strong. Uh, he was wondering how they would receive such a correction. Major issues, granted. One issue was a guy was going to bed with his stepmother. And the church wasn't doing anything about it. Lawsuits, gifts kind of out of order, marriages out of order, lack of understanding of the teaching of the resurrection, eating food sacrificed to demons. I mean, it's a church that's got some issues. So he writes 1 Corinthians. Then he tells Titus, his precious young apostle being raised up, Titus, I want you to do a follow-up Go to Corinth and see how they responded to my letter. I'm burdened. I'll meet you in Troas. I'm going to leave Ephesus here fairly soon. And I'm going to go up into northern Greece. And i got to go up to Troas first, cross over into northern Greece. And I'll meet you there in Troas. So Paul's burdened. The pressure continues to mount in terms of the warfare from Ephesus. He's near the breaking point. And he finally slips into a ship that makes a fairly short journey straight north to the port of Troas, and Titus is not there. Oh my. Paul's worst fear is realized. They didn't respond to the letter, and they were so furious, they could have taken out Titus. He was thinking he could be dead. Well, he doesn't stay in Troas. He goes west, first to Philippi, or, or, or the port city, and then he ends up in Philippi. And 
While in Philippi, guess who comes? Titus. Oh, what a reunion. They are so rejoicing, tears are flowing, dancing, jumping, and then furthermore, Titus says to Paul, the letter worked. They responded. The anointing was so strong when they read it publicly, they broke. The worst case scenario, the guy that was having that crazy relationship with stepmother, he broke. Repented. Amen. Apostolic discipline. Great need in the church. Can't go there now. Was working. So from Philippi, Paul writes what we know as 2 Corinthians. He didn't really write it. He dictated it. Somebody copied and was like a secretary. And now we get a hint and a look into chapter 1. Make no mistake about it. I was totally dead in many ways. I was despairing of life. Wow, we're talking serious apostle here, walking faithful with Jesus for many, many years. Now he's despairing of life and on the verge of depression, he would have those moments in his journey. Paul was prone to that. And, and so he said, I was despairing of life, but that was to bring me to a point where I no longer really trusted in me at all, but instead was relying on the God who raises the dead. Amen. In chapter 4, he has this spectacular revelation that kind of depicts the forest. He said, I had some serious trees going on in Ephesus, and I couldn't look beyond my hand because it was so immediate. It was so in the now, the trial, the, the despair, and everything that was hitting me like a 90 mile an hour head on wind. But something happened in Philippi. Maybe it was triggered by the good news from Titus. But Paul very much got caught up in worship in that tabernacle of David that we talked about last night. He beheld afresh the beauty of his Lord and he heard the Lord afresh and he saw something and then he writes in 2 Corinthians 4 these momentary light afflictions are producing something in my life. An eternal weight of glory. In 2 Corinthians 1, Paul is under the burden to the point of breaking, and it would be heavy, and it would be depressing, and it would be discouraging. In chapter 4, he now labels the very same trial as a momentary light affliction. That's a man who just saw the forest and went away from the trees and it's producing an eternal weight of glory you know child of God when you get to heaven you're going to kiss your trials you're going to kiss your trials at those times when Lord I thought you forsook me I thought you left me now that's when I was carrying you and nobody looks for a trial nobody oh I praise God I'm, well, how's your walk brother I'm believing God for a trial tomorrow Really? No. See, your spirituality is not demonstrated in your actions under good conditions. Your true depth of character and spirituality is demonstrated on, on your reactions to pressure. And, and so the Lord kind of reveals us to us. So Paul writes 2 Corinthians, and then he begins his journey. Now, what he does now, he he goes from Philippi down to Corinth. And while he's in Corinth, he writes this epistle that we have learned to appreciate in the summer of 57 AD called Romans. 
Somebody say, yeah, that's a pretty heavy book. That's a wonderful book. <laughs> and so from Corinth, he, he, he does Romans. Now he's got a burden. He wants to go to Jerusalem. And he wants to go to Jerusalem, and he wants to bring a love gift. Paul always had a, a tenuous relationship with Jerusalem. They didn't quite figure him out. Many of them didn't like him. Some of them actually hated him. Uh, so he wanted to kind of go overboard, go to Jerusalem, maybe for the last time, bring them a love gift. So he lifts it. He takes this offering from the churches that are in Greece. And he's getting ready now to go to Jerusalem with this financial gift and blessing. And he wants to be there by Pentecost. He agrees to go by ship and then all of a sudden he learns, you can read this all in Acts 20, he, he learns that there's a plot from the Jews that are going to try to kill him. So instead, he walks back to Philippi, goes over to Troas, and that's when he preaches all night long, and the guy falls out of the window, right dead, Paul raises him up. Something now begins to happen. And so if we could cue up Acts 20, verses 22, 23, 24, this is what I want to zero in on. This is part of the address that Paul gave to the elders of Ephesus. And I want to read this. Acts, actually, we're, I'm sorry, we're going to go down to Acts 20, verse 22. Acts 20, verse 22, 23, 24. And I would encourage you to read these verses, look at these verses, read Acts 20. Uh, his message for the last time to the elders of Ephesus. Remember, he was there three years Many of them, if not most of them, uh, he led to the Lord. They loved him. Paul loved them. And he basically gives a, a review or a description of how he functioned as an apostle while he was there for three years. And he says in verse 22, And now, behold, bound in spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. On the one hand, Paul's quite prophetic, really hears God, but on the other hand, God also required of Paul a walk of faith similar to Abraham when he's not going to be aware of what may or may not happen on the journey. But he's still walking by faith, he knows God wants him in Jerusalem. He knows God wants him to release this gift. Verse 23. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city. Now this is without exception. In every city, say. Now, this was primarily, if you could think of, personal prophecies Paul kept receiving now from Troas, Corinth, Philippi, at least three churches. I want you to get the big picture so this will make sense to you. Hang in there with me. Paul's on a journey, and in every church, they'd have a time of worship, time of blessing, and then somebody would come under the anointing, and they say, and they would prophesy to Paul. Say, Paul, uh, you keep going to Jerusalem, there's trouble awaiting you. And then it gets very specific here, chains and imprisonment. First city, second city, third city. Except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city. Bonds and affliction await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Now, if you're permitted to write in your Bible or make marks in your Bible, Acts 20, 
verse 24 is one of the foundational great declarations of why Paul is the example he is. The reason he can write 2 Timothy 4 at the end of his life, I have finished my course. See, you have a course. I have a course. It's, it's defined by God. It's sovereignly set up by God. It was set up by God before, while you were in your mother's womb, even before you were created. It, it's all set by God. It's your course. It's your course. It's your personal course. You're responsible. I, I can't finish your course. I can help you. I can come alongside at key moments maybe and give you a word and so forth. So here's what's happening as Paul is walking out his course and he goes through these three churches. Wow, Paul, thus says the Lord, trouble in your future, afflictions, imprisonment. How does Paul respond to that? We'll come back to those three verses. He finishes this great uh, message to the elders of Ephesus. Uh, and at the very end, they weep aloud. They embrace Paul, repeatedly kiss him, verse 37. Grieving especially over the word that he had spoken, they would see his face no more. You can just get a feel of the, of, the, of the depth of their relationship. In Acts 21, they continue on the ship. They leave the port city of Miletus, and they continue on their way to Jerusalem. Look at verse 4. They come to a place called Tyre. And after looking up the disciples, they stayed there seven days. And they kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. So here's another church prophesying the same thing and now interpreting that prophecy, meaning he shouldn't even go to Jerusalem. How does Paul respond to that? They continue on with their journey and they, they come in verse... Uh, Starting with verse, uh, let's just go down. It's the same thing in another verse. Uh, we'll go down to verse uh, uh, 10. This is uh, Philip the evangelist and his house in Caesarea. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. Philip's house was a prophetic house. The word of the Lord was expressed repeatedly. They were all very sensitive to the Spirit. And they're there, and Luke is traveling with Paul and some others now, and there's something in Luke, as well as the other traveling companions, they're getting a little bit concerned. Wow. This is getting kind of heavy. And then all of a sudden, Agabus shows up. Now, who's Agabus? He's a very well-known prophet in the region. He's got a name. Remember, we were talking about name guys last night. But he's really accurate. He doesn't miss it. Amen. He's the one that prophesied the famine. And they responded to that prophecy. And it was wonderful. And now, all of a sudden, they're in a meeting. And, and they have this, this prophetic moment. And he takes Paul's belt. And he binds up his own hands. Well, let's just read it. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own feet and hands, and said, this is what the Spirit says. Whoa, now everybody's going to pay attention here, including Paul. In this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. It's all in quotes. Whoa. So city after city topped off with Agabus showing up. Well, obviously, the Spirit of God is trying to get through to this thick-headed apostle. What are you doing? 
You're too valuable. Stop. Don't go to Jerusalem. And notice how it phrases in verse 12, and when we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging him. It's a very, very strong word. Weeping, begging, not to go up to Jerusalem. What would you do if you were Paul? What would you do if you were Paul? Where church after church after church capped off with a name, prophet, who's got a reputation of really being accurate. And now your close friends that you've slept with and, and have gotten beaten with and have raised up churches with are begging you not to go up to Jerusalem. How would you respond? Paul says, what are you doing? Verse 13, weeping and breaking my heart. For I am not ready for I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now catch verse 14. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, almost in a kind of friendship exasperation, the will of the Lord be done. In other words, they tried to talk Paul out of it repeatedly. They tried to talk him out of it repeatedly after Agabus's prophecy. And after these things, we got ready and started on our way to Jerusalem, and so they arrived. Now I want you to go back to Acts 20, 24. And I have New American Standard. Does anybody in the house have the New King James Version? Can I, can I borrow your Bible just for one second, Russ? I want you to listen now. You have Acts 20, 24 up there on the screen. Is that right? Yeah. All right, now I love Acts. I love the New American Standard, but my Bible says, but they don't get it really correctly on this translation. They kind of miss it. New King James is much better. And here's what it says. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me. And it's a semicolon. You don't have that in New American Standard. It's just kind of a flow up there. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that. Now that's, that's okay, but this is better. But none of these things move me, semicolon, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that. So then it picks up there with so that. Remember now we talked about so that? In other words, you can't go on the other side of so that unless you fulfill the left side of so that. Fair enough? Yes. So how many will agree on the right side of so that, I do want to finish my course, Lord, and the ministry which you have called me to, and you're all called to a ministry, you're all assigned a course, but in order for that to happen, you got to fulfill or walk out the left side of so that, and the new King James says, none of these things move me, and then the second part, the key word there is none of these things. And more specifically, it's the word things. Now, I've been doing life of Paul for 35 years off and on. And to my embarrassment, I saw something here I had never seen before. The word for things is logos. It's words. In the beginning was the word. Word. Logos. Word. Yep. Paul is basically saying, 
In order for me to finish my course, in order to be finish my ministry, uh, I'm in a place of surrender. Well, how'd you get to that place of surrender, Lord? Well, I'm bound in spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You want to get to that place. You're going to need that in 2021. What does it mean to be bound? Bound, boy, doesn't that sound restrictive? Doesn't that sound, I don't know, almost kind of heavy? Trust me, the more you and I are bound to Jesus Christ, the more free we are That's true. of whatever the world's going to try to do to us. The more we are bound and all in and surrendered, the more we will be released to finish the course that God has assigned to us. None of these things move me. <clears throat> None of these words move me. In the case of what I just took you through, thank you for your patience, not even accurate prophecies move me and get me off course. Why, Paul? Well, I had a deeper word locked in between me and Jesus. And he told me very clearly and very, very specifically to go to Jerusalem. Well, then what's this all about? Cap, you know, summarized by Agabus, uh, the, the, the name prophet. Uh, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Yeah, amen. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, first you get the prophecy, but now you better accurately interpret the prophecy. His friends and his close loving friends got in their soul out of spirit and misinterpreted the prophecies thinking that uh, Paul's not heeding the warning. He's not getting it. We got to somehow stop to the point where they beg, they plead, they cry. Paul says, none of these things, even true prophecies from the name prophet of God. What are you doing? You're breaking my heart. I'm bound in spirit. I'm bound to the will of God. I'm bound to following Jesus. In one sense, you're not helping me right now. I don't care how accurate your prophecy is. I'm really overemphasizing this because I want you to get this point. Paul's not moved by true prophecies. Christians in today's church are moved by false prophecies. God have mercy on us. No discernment to even blow the whistle on. That came out of your soul. That came out of the imagination of your heart. That's nothing but an echo because you heard some other prophet saying you're just repeating it. Blah, blah, blah. And on and on it goes. Paul's not even moved by true words. Let alone false words. He's certainly not going to be moved by demonic lies. He's certainly not going to be moved by circumstantial difficulties, right? Right. And so, how do you get to that point? Uh, bound, bound, bound in spirit. Bound in spirit. Now what happens is he comes to Jerusalem and I want you to, I want you to catch this now because here's Paul, wow. Uh, now, now here's what happens. God brought, brought, will bring him now to another point of beyond even his own maturity so that he's going to have a fresh breaking and a fresh... See, we, we think we're done with our trials. If you're really growing in Jesus, it just means your trials are more demanding. Amen. <laughs> and the good news is, say amen, oh my, I didn't know if I signed up for this. Uh, God will never allow a 10th grade Christian to take a 12th grade test. Mm. Say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. His sovereignty protects you in that sense. Mm -hmm. Now, the 10th grade test is tough enough, but he won't let you get beyond what you're able to endure. So Paul's in Jerusalem, and what happens is, even though he's willing to die, he really is. He's serious. Come on. Paul's thinking at this point, even though when he wrote Romans, see this now, we're talking forest trees. 
When he wrote Romans in chapter 15, he tells the Roman church, he says, listen, here's what's in my heart. Here's my desire. After I visit you, I'm going to Spain. You can read that in Romans 15. So that's where Paul thought his course was going to take him eventually to Spain. So he's willing to die in Jerusalem, but really he doesn't think he's going to die in Jerusalem. He, he's going to be in Jerusalem for a while, give the love offering, and then he's going to go to Rome, visit them, and then he's going to go to Spain. Well, God has some other plans in mind. Can we all agree that the Lord, well, you know what, what, what brother says, one thing about God, he thinks he's God. <laughs> and he might just reserve the right to checkmate you, stop you in your tracks. It's all good. If it takes a trial to do it, so be it. If it's the leading of the Spirit, wonderful. Paul had all kinds of times in his journey. He didn't know the will of God for his life. He kept moving. He didn't really know where God wanted him and when God wanted him, wherever it was, until that time in Troas and you get that vision. Oh, we, we're supposed to go to Greece. I thought we were supposed to go to Ephesus. No, that's not time. You've got to go to Greece. Well, look at Acts 21, verse 30. And all the city was aroused, and the people rushed together, and taking hold of Paul, they dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut, and while they were seeking to kill him, some of them say literally tearing to pieces. It was a mob out of control. Yeah. A religious mob. Ouch. Here come the chains. Here come the afflictions. And it went even beyond what Paul thought it would be, to be honest. Roman soldiers saved his life that day. <coughs> he then, the next day, stands before the sun, gives a witness to the whole crowd, and they're, they're, they're fed up with him. They want to put him to death. Look at it, as he's talking about it. Verse 22, Acts 22, 22. And they listened to him up to that statement. They raised their voices. Away with such a fellow. He should not be allowed to live. They were crying and throwing dust in the air. The commander came. My, my, who is this guy? So the commander says, we're going to stretch him on the rack. Very, very painful. Shoulders will go out and join all kind of stuff. We're going to examine him and get the truth out of him by putting him on the rack. Paul says, you're going to do that to a Roman citizen? Really? They get really afraid. Well, aren't you so... No, no. Well, I purchased this Roman citizenship. Paul says, I was born a Roman citizen. Next day, he's speaking before the Sanhedrin uh, in Acts 23. Verse 1, it's before the council. And now we come to verse 11. And this is one of those landmark moments that repeatedly happen in the life of Paul. And it can happen in our lives. It's nighttime. And heavy. At this point, as Paul underestimated the ferociousness of the religious mob, he's actually afraid. He knew he had a word to go to Jerusalem. But now he's afraid. And he really thinks he's going to die now, but it could be pretty brutal. And here's what it says. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Aren't you 
grateful that you belong to a God who stands by your side in the nighttime. That's what you really needed. And God now comes, and what does he do? Always. He gives Paul a personal prophecy. It's a personal word. Child of God, this is one of the reasons the church at large in America right now is kind of in trouble is because of how they have circumvented their own personal seeking of God and have relied on the prophets out there. Yeah. As we talked last night, it's nothing more than a glorified fortune-telling session. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Mm -hmm. You are a sheep, mm -hmm. and you are in covenant with Jesus Christ. And one of the great privileges of being in covenant with your great shepherd is you can, you will hear his voice. Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. Don't be de de dependent on others at the expense of your personal hearing his voice. And yet many believers is like, you know, I struggle, I struggle, I struggle hearing the voice of God. I get it. I understand. How does God primarily speak to us? Through his word. You got about 85, maybe 90% right about here. Know your Bibles. Cherish the word. Have you ever seen a Chinese Christian open up a Bible for the first time in their life? Yes. On a YouTube maybe video? Look it up. Some of them are almost stunned where they can't even open it. They just hold it close to their breast and weep profusely as the American Christian has Bibles with dust on them. Lord, help us. Be in your word. It costs over the centuries a lot. You know, uh, Voltaire, the great hater of Christianity, leading philosopher of his day, mocked Christianity his entire life. He said, a hundred years after my death, Christianity will be no more. That's what he said. He was a French philosopher. A hundred years after his death, his house was printing Bibles <laughs> and gospel tracts. And the word of God was being spread around the world from that house. God is not mocked. That's right. God is not mocked. So Paul, he gets a word. Now, in every trial of your life, okay, the word of the Lord is a two-edged sword. It's like two sides to the same coin. And here's how you break it down. The number one thing the word of the Lord will do is it will speak to your present condition. In the case of Paul, he's wrestling with fear, and he thinks, wow, this is it. So the first part of the word of the Lord, you can read it there in your red letters in verse, it, we can put New America back up there, Acts 23, verse 11. Uh, the Lord comes and stands at his side, and my Bible goes to red letters, I love it. Take courage. First two words. Now this is God speaking. This is the living, sharper Word of God, life-giving Word of God, creative Word of God. What do you think happened to the fear that was lodged in Paul's heart? It got absolutely laser-treated, blasted out like a dynamite, and it made this incredible freedom from that and replaced it with courage. When the word of the Lord comes, it brings faith, hope, love. So that's his present condition being addressed. And then the second part of the prophecy is speaking to his future. Now, Paul, at this point, because he underestimated the ferocity, he really still thought he was going to die in Jerusalem. He said, and, and the word of the Lord is... For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, you're doing it, Paul. You're speaking publicly. You're speaking to the Sanhedrin. You're testifying. You're witnessing. 
So you must. Say it with me. Must. Must. Boy, if you want to do a good Bible study, just look up the word must. And when you hear must, I want you to hear lordship. I want you to hear sovereignty. I want you to hear divine checkmate. I want you to hear um, carrying you footprints in the sand. You must witness in Rome. Wow. Pack the suitcases, honey. I guess we're going to Rome. That ball's not very good. You get that one. Well, that word is pretty awesome. I wonder how God's going to do that. I, I love verse 12, which explains this elaborate plot of the religious zealots. Is it 40 of them? I think so. They take a vow. And the vow is we're not going to eat, we're not going to drink until we kill this guy. That's it. So you see what's happening? The religious vow people are now coming against the word of the Lord. None of these things move me. Now you got some serious things coming at you. Paul finds out about it. God always springs. He always springs revelation to the enemy's next step. If we're walking close and we're intimate and we're really got our ears open, okay? Mm -hmm. That's why Paul's able to say, I'm not ignorant of his schemes. I know how he operates. Frankly, by the word of the Lord, I'm always a step ahead. I might be behind God, but I'm gonna stay ahead of the enemy. Fair enough? Amen. And so his nephew finds out and a long story short, the Roman guards are, they, they provide 470 Roman combination army to escort Paul to Caesarea. That's the port city. About a day's journey. And I'm looking at that chapter one time. While the enemy came at me with 40, God provides 470 Come on, church, it's not a fair fight. It's not a fair fight. The grace of God is so far above and beyond the ability of the enemy. That's why this foolishness, and you'll hear some prophetic spin in the next month or so. Well, I prophesied he was going to get reelected. It was a true word, but the devil stole it. That's a good indication that guy's false. He may be saved but he gave a false prophecy. Satan is not almost equal to God. Yeah. Satan is nothing but a pawn in the hands of God. Amen, brother. Don't get bossed down wrestling. Well, did the enemy, did God, did the enemy? Hey, listen, you got a major issue in your life you're going to have to deal with. You don't have to deal with the source of it. You've got to deal with the reality of it. God's sovereignty is what it is. Please study it well. He is in charge. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing ultimately happens that doesn't first <coughs> pass through the sovereign, permissive hands of God. End of story. Now, if we don't believe that, we're going to go crazy trying to figure out the the unexplainable, the mysteries, the disappointments. Why do I have to preach a funeral of a dear pastor friend of mine, of his 12-year-old girl, the baby, burned to death in a car accident, of which her sister was the driver, broken hip, another one in the front seat, on a summer night, and they crawled out 
the windows with a broken hip and she pulled out Mary from the passenger and she went back for her Tanya, her sister, but it hit a tree at 60 miles an hour. And the doors wouldn't open. And by that time, the car was so hot she had to back off. Tanya went to heaven. Pastor Laverle and his wife Lois are at home on a Sunday night. They receive a phone call from his deacon. Laverle, your car's in my yard on fire. Mom and dad are first at the scene. They attend to Mary and Tessa, the daughter. Where's Tanya? She's in the back seat. The car's engulfed in flames. Laverne asked me to preach the funeral. I wrestle. I wrestle. Oh my Lord. You got, you got false doctrine coming at you. You got naysaying Job's friends coming and saying their little two bit 25 cent piece of nothing. You got all kinds of things going on. I said, God, I need a word and I need a clear word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Your verse, son, is Romans 8 28. Amen. All things mm -hmm. work together. For good. To those who love him. To those who love God. And are called according to his purpose. All things. That almost made me feel worse. <laughs> In one sense. What in the world? How does this make any sense out of a 12 year old going to heaven through a fiery car accident? It doesn't say all things are good. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Some things are good. Some things are unexplainable. Some things are painful. Some things are demonic. Some things are circumstantial. But they're all woven together in a massive forest of divine, sovereign unity. Amen. Wow. So I sought God. I sought God. I said, Lord, help me, please. I wish I had my other Bible now with me. It's a black New American Standard. I wrote 10 things down in the column of my Bible, right by Romans 8, 28, 10 good things that happened. I think it was 10, it could be seven, uh, of the good things that will now happen because of Tanya's death. Do I know what number one was? I said, Tanya's with Jesus right now. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Laverle, the father, had this incredible relationship with his, his four daughters. They all started with T. Tammy, Tessa, Tara, Tanya, Tori, five daughters. Tanya was the baby. She's the age of my middle daughter. And during the funeral, he could not walk. He was carried in by friends. He was just kind of dragging on his feet. Beyond, beyond any soul capacity, just a broken, shattered father. The mother was actually quite stoic. It's like the grace of God was on her to the point where it was really helpful. I want you to fast forward now about three months. Laverle has this kind of breakthrough with the Lord, and he's doing good. I mean, he's in good, mm -hmm. <laughs> crying a lot, but she is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you start there, right? Yeah. Please start there. Mm -hmm. and, and then... And then the mother kind of collapsed. And so she's at home weeping, praying, interceding, crying out to Jesus. 
as only a mama can. I mean, come on, everybody has a mama. Mm -hmm. There's a bond between mama and child that's different than father and child. True. It's not necessarily better, it's different. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden she had a vision. I mean, like watching a movie. And she saw Tanya in heaven, walking with Jesus. The most beautiful, like, meadow. And it was spectacular in its brilliance. And Tanya really had zero interest in her. She was totally caught up and enraptured with the countenance. I think we sang it, looking at his eyes. Didn't we sing that today? And, and uh, they just had this thing on. The phone rings. And she's having the vision. And her most trusted intercessor was praying for her that morning. She said, Lois, I was on my knees. And the Lord just took me up. And I got caught up. And I saw a vision. And explained in exquisite detail the exact thing that Mama had just seen. That began to break the pain and begin to release a healing grace. And Laverle and Lois, that was in 1985. I forget the years they died, but it's decades later. Hey, guess what? The enemy never got in there with bitterness, uh, depression, I, I, I don't want to follow this kind of God. No, they remain faithful service to the Lord to the day they die. Amen. Amen. And all kinds of fruit flowed out of that unexplainable time. So Paul, Paul gets this incredible fresh word. He's there in Caesarea for two years. I got to go. Oh, you know, I forgot to do it again. Unbelievable. Go figure. It must be the Lord. All things work together for good. Say amen. I forgot to press the start button. Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. What does it say there, brother? I don't know. 43 minutes? You have no idea how many times I forget to press the start button. Paul will be two years, he'll be two years in uh, Caesarea testifying before Felix, Agrippa, Festus. He goes on the mother of all ship voyages in Acts 27. And what God does, this is a big picture now, his apostle through that shipwreck is sent to a small island called Malta. How many people got saved on that island? Everyone got saved on the island. If you were sick, you got healed. Mm -hmm. And God blew that ship so far off course through that storm and sent his apostle to Malta. Oh, and by the way, P.S., as much as he had this natural inclination for Spain, he never went there. He stayed in Rome for two years. He was released for a while went up into northern Greece, and then was suddenly arrested for the second time. And there's some years in between there. And the second imprisonment ends up in 2 Timothy 4, where he dies. So, forests and trees. Are you bound in spirit to the depths of your heart? To the will of God. That's the linchpin. That's what connects the trailer to the truck. You put the pin through. I'm bound in spirit. Paul says, I had such a life of worship. I had so many times of saying, yes, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. I surrender, Lord. It was such a repeated part of his walk. He was bound in spirit. Nothing can move him away from because of that linchpin. 
Even he can't do it. As much as he will have trials and discouragements and depression and but God always comes. He always comes. So, total surrender is the call for the hour. All entrusted to him. 2 Timothy 1. God will guard everything that's entrusted to him. Amen. Number two, believe, ask for, press in, thank him for your own internal hearing. John 10, my sheep hear my voice. Every prophecy, however accurate, needs accurate interpretation, number two, and it needs accurate application. <clears throat> On your journey, particularly in the moments, the night times of your life, know this and just rest in it, God will give you a fresh word. Number five, please rest. If you struggle with it, uh, you're not mentally going to grasp it. You don't need to. But please study. <coughs> study the sovereignty of God. How can I be in the mind of God the day Jesus died? How can I be there that day when he died? Well, you were chosen by God. Really? When was that? Before the world was created. Mm -hmm. Amen. Please read Ephesians 1. Yeah. Don't you see your relationship with God begins in his choice, not your accepting Jesus at a Billy Graham crusade. You didn't first choose him. He chose you unto adoption. See, that's a hedge. I don't try to figure it out here. I enjoy it here. And all the rest, security, peace, it brings. Wow. Your relationship with God is not based upon what you do. Your relationship to God is based upon what he has already done. Amen. Calvary. <laughs> It's called grace and faith working together, offering the free gift of eternal life. Rest, rest, rest in his sovereignty. Please also just write down, if you're doing no, uh, look at these crazy notes. You wonder how I ever get through a sermon. Can you make any sense out of that? Huh? It's pillar to post. We just kind of wander around. Oh, that. Horse and trees. Second Corinthians 1 is the trees. You despair of life because it's really heavy. Second Corinthians 4 is the forest. And you'll find other portions of scripture that will illustrate both. Big picture. Big picture. Uh, God's really big time in the headlines. But he's also very much into fine print. Mm -hmm. He's big picture, but he's also attention to detail. Mm -hmm. My wife is incredibly gifted to attention to detail. And it drives Chuck crazy. <laughs> she says, clean the house before I get home. Pick it up. We got company tonight. Praise God. What do I do? I clean the house. She walks in, it's not a minute, it's a mess! <laughs> really? And she starts pointing out things, yeah, that is kind of, Lord have mercy. God is big picture, that's kind of us guys, we like, you know, don't give me the fine print, just give me the headlines, okay? <laughs> Women like to communicate. <laughs> not just part of the story, they're going to give us the whole story. That's right. Amen. Praise God. Right? Amen. 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 Amen.
When both of the husband and wife are in the spirit, it's a dynamic union that is really strong. That's cool. But when either one of them get in the flesh or both get in the flesh, then you got, well, you got two ships passing in the night. Amen. The Lord knows. Marriage is from heaven. Say it with me right now. Marriage is from heaven. Marriage is from heaven. Yes. Amen. Uh, forests and trees. Rest in this. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. What the Lord has begun in your life, he will finish. Yep. Yeah. He will complete. Yep. Amen. Might be verse 6. Philippians 1 verse 6. So that we can all say, God willing, mm -hmm. in agreement with Paul in 2 Timothy 4, I have finished my course. Yes. That's right. I, I pray we all can say that mm -hmm. at the end of our lives with some measure of, uh, of truth, genuineness. Uh, praise God. I don't, I don't get, you know, praise God, I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I'm really discouraged, I just soon get there sooner than later. Yeah. You know, so got, but then I feel like, you know, Paul, that's what he said, right? He says, I, I long to be with Jesus, yeah. to be honest with you. But the Lord won't allow me because I still got some more stuff to do on my course. So I'm bound in spirit. I'm bound in spirit. Father, in Jesus' name, help us, Lord. And in your own words, as I pray, just... Surrender to him. Lord, I want to be bound in spirit. I want to be bound in spirit. Bound in spirit. I want the linchpin. Lord, connecting me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Whatever is going on in your life right now, just entrust yourself and entrust all else to Jesus. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Don opened the meeting last night of giving us a kind of a prayer. Of, uh, of a painful thing in Steve's family. Steve's here this morning. <coughs> uh, I want somebody to lay hands on Steve. <coughs> Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Fill my brother and fill this family. peace, with rest. Yes. <coughs> Steve, the Lord's going to fill you with timely words yes. for these days. Yes. Precise words for different ones yes. in the family. Just be sensitive to him. You might pull this one aside whisper uh, so Lord we just release prophetic revelation to yes. our brother to flow for a brother and a father who doesn't know what to do mothers, grandmother children, siblings aunts, uncles God release your prophetic word Out of this unexplained, Lord, you will bring forth fruit. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray a guard yes. around the entire family yes. against every lie, yes. every attack, yes. every advantage Satan tried to do yes. to bring fruit and pain. We cut it off right now. Yes. 
Jesus' name.